Hart, uh, Executive Director for Lane County uh, History Museum and Historical Society. And I want to welcome everyone to the last of our fall series of uh, uh, rather COVID-influenced uh, history pubs. Uh, and uh, we, of course, will pick up again uh, in January. And I'm going to let Marsha uh, tell you about the next program. But this is the fourth and last for the, the, uh, the fall. And we have an uh, exceptional speaker uh, tonight, uh, Eliza Canty Jones. Uh, and I was privileged to hear her speak to my Rotary Club and give a much shorter uh, rendition of what you're going to hear tonight. So I'm really uh, interested in hearing the longer rendition because I know she skipped lots of slides at Rotary, you know, with a 20 minute <laughs> presentation. So uh, you're all going to in for a treat. Now, Eliza is a rather interesting speaker to, to start with. Uh, she's the editor of the Oregon Historical Society's Quarterly. Uh, and for those of you uh, who are regular readers, you're, you're probably aware uh, that she had a very special issue come out not so long ago on white supremacy. Uh, and it was one of those issues that maybe every Oregonian ought to read. Uh, it was the result of a two-year project. Uh, it was turned over to other researchers to, to uh, complete. And they did an excellent job of covering over the years since Vancouver was around. Uh, you know, I basically they they covered up to the present day. So it, it, for those people who say, well, it doesn't apply now. Well, yeah, you need to read the the articles. So it was an absolutely excellent issue, but. Uh, since I've heard her speak before and introduced her before, I, I was, wanted to go a little bit beyond what you can find out, uh, you know, in the bio and the Oregon Historical Society uh, website. So I, I went back to find out about her education. She got an MA uh, in Pacific Northwest and Public History from Portland State. Okay, but where was the BA from? Well, the BA was in English from St. Mary's College in Maryland. Well, I didn't know anything about St. Mary's College in Maryland. So I did a little research on that and discovered that this year, now of course she wasn't in school this year, she was here with us, but this year US News and World Report rated St. Mary's, uh, the state's honors school, uh, as being one of the five best liberal arts colleges in the United States. So I was tremendously impressed by that. Uh, and the information I got went on a little further to say that St. Mary's is located where? In St. Mary's City. Well, where is St. Mary's City? I've heard of Annapolis and Baltimore, but where is St. Mary's City? Well, I, Eliza in our chat before we opened up tonight uh, said she grew up on the Eastern Shore. Well, I know where that is. That's the Atlantic side. But if you look at the geography of Maryland, the Chesapeake Bay kind of bisects, not quite equally, uh, but St. Mary's City is actually on that western side of the Chesapeake, closer to Virginia. Uh, okay, so I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, and she apparently was the, uh, a co-editor of an oral folk history of Southern Maryland. And I kind of thought about that for a while and went, you know, an oral folk history, I'll bet that has a lot to do with African-American uh, folklore. Uh, know, having knowing a little bit about South Carolina and Barrier Islands and the folklore down there. So I, I think your speaker tonight comes with a whole lot of knowledge that is beyond Oregon. Uh, and, and that's valuable because it makes it a little broader than it might be if we just spoke uh, about Oregon. Uh, I think tonight she's just going to speak about Oregon. But what I wanted to suggest is the knowledge base is broader than that. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce actually Marsha to say something about the follow on and then we'll let Eliza uh, hold forth tonight about women's suffrage, racism uh, and civil rights, uh, an Oregon overview. Okay, thank Marcia, you. Marsha, take it away. <clears throat> I'm Marsha Weisiger. I'm the um, Julie and Rocky Dixon Chair of US Western History, <clears throat> excuse me at the University of Oregon in the Department of History. And uh, we're co-hosts of History Pub with the uh, 
McLean County History Museum next month on, um, well, the second Monday of the month, whatever date that is, it might be the 12th, I'm not sure, of January, will be um, a, uh, Annalise Hines, who is a, um, an assistant professor of history in the history department at the U of O. She, has, she specializes in women's history and um, has written a fabulous book that will come out soon on the history of the Mahjong craze during the 1920s and how that uh, reflects um, various gender ideals and um, ethnic identity uh, issues and um, the uh, kind of um, fascination with the Oriental, if you will, and women who dressed up in costumes, uh, Chinese costumes while playing Mahjong and what that meant to them. Mostly Jewish women dressing up like Asian women, very strange. But at any rate, and she'll bring a Mahjong set in to our Zoom um, uh, environment to kind of show off her Mahjong set, I think, as part of that. Uh, so we look forward to that. Again, that's the second um, Monday in January that she'll be speaking. So uh, without uh, much more ado, I want to bring Eliza uh, to speak, but I wanna note that uh, in addition to editing the Oregon Historical Quarterly, Eliza is also the um, Director of Community Engagement at the Oregon Historical Society. She does an excellent job of that. I have to say, Eliza reached out to me when I moved here about 10 years ago. She was one of the first people I met. She and Bob, actually, were two of the first people I met uh, who reached out to me and made me feel welcome here in Eugene. And so welcome to you, Eliza, and I'll turn over the mic to you. Oh, and I'd like to remind people uh, to mute themselves for now until we get to the Q&A part and um, just be conscious of the fact that you are on camera. And so if you uh, need to do anything that you wouldn't want the whole world to see, you might wanna turn off your camera at that time. But for now, it's great when you can turn your cameras on because it's easier for the speaker to speak to live human beings than it is to a bunch of black boxes. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to you, Eliza. Thank you so much, Marsha and Bob. What a what a wonderful, warm welcome. And it is nice to see your faces. Usually, um, most of the time at programs like these, my role is the one that Marsha and Bob have just taken. And so um, it's, it's really fun to come on and be the speaker. So I really appreciate the invitation. Um, Bob, thank you so much for looking into St. Mary's College. It's a wonderful, public co-ed liberal arts college um, and historic St. Mary City is a really fascinating place in, or in United States history. And I did not care or think about history very much while I was a student there until I took a course called cultural journalism that Professor Andrea Hammer offered. And we began to do oral histories with people who lived in Southern Maryland. And so it was from that course that we created Slackwater, the journal, which is still published uh, in Maryland. And there've been many volumes of it since then. And uh, the first one, we got to know folks who lived on St. George Island and many of the watermen in that community. And that's a term that's not really used, I've learned since outside the Chesapeake Bay very much, uh, but watermen work the cycles of the water. And so watermen in Chesapeake Bay, uh, in the old days at least, I don't know what things are like these days, but they would oyster in the winter and they would crab in the summer and they would fish in the fall and they would mend their nets and take care of their boats and everything in between. So it's really a, a beautiful cycle eating all of those delicious foods. So thank you for making me think about St. Mary's. It's a beautiful place if you have any kids who are about to be college age. Um, if you're gonna send them somewhere gorgeous and small and wonderful, I recommend St. Mary's. So there's my advertisement there. <laughs> I'll go ahead and pull my screen, my slides up. And then what I'll do is just, um, I'll also uh, pull up the chat so that I can see it. Um, and then I'll keep my eye on that. And if folks have questions or comments um, as I'm speaking, um, and you wanna try and put those in the chat, uh, feel free to do so. Um, and then otherwise, I, I think that's about it. So I'll just get going. So thanks for having me tonight. Um, 
what I'm really going to talk about a lot in this program is just Oregon woman suffrage activism. I want to think some about the national context with specific information about Black women's activism, the significance of Native sovereignty, and the impact of xenophobia and citizenship on women's rights, women's voting rights. Um, so as Bob mentioned, really this project that we completed in December last year, releasing the special issue of OHQ, uh, changed a lot of the way that I think about Oregon history and the world today. And really helped me to see that white supremacy has just been a big part of Oregon's history since the before the state was founded. Um, and I also know that black women and indigenous women and other women of color um, have also been central to the state and have provided um, a lot of really valuable leadership and fights for full citizenship, which include voting rights. So that's my hope is to talk about um, those people and their work today and also the contexts that they were working in. So I always wanna begin the programs um, by thinking about the fact that wherever we are in Oregon or in the United States, and indeed most places in the Americas, if not all, we're on indigenous land. Um, so I know there in Eugene, in your part of the valley, uh, that you all are thinking about the, the tribes and the indigenous peoples whose homelands you live and work and play on. I'm in Southeast Portland right now, which is the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clum, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala, Bands of the Chinook, uh, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many of the other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. Um, so we know that indigenous nations have sovereignty and that sovereignty is inherent. Excuse me one second, Darby, quit it. You will occasionally hear my dogs during this presentation. Um, so we know that that sovereignty of native nations is inherent, but sometimes it's recognized by the federal government and sometimes it's not. We also know that indigenous people have ongoing relationships to land and plants and animals and those relationships have been severely disrupted, but not destroyed by genocide and land theft. So what I've got up here are the covers of three books that I think are really helpful in thinking about this history. Uh, Bob Miller's book on Native America, Discovered and Conquered, really looks at the history of the doctrine of discovery, this European legal system that laid claims for civilized and Christian nations that gave them the preemptive right to lands of indigenous peoples. It's a fascinating history and one well worth understanding. Uh, Jeffrey Osler, your own Jeffrey Osler there at the University of Oregon has recently published Surviving Genocide, Native Nations in the United States from the American Revolution to Bleeding Kansas. This is a stunning piece of scholarship that looks at the processes of warfare and removal, dispossession, starvation, and the creation and perpetuation of contexts that really amplified the effects of disease. So he's thinking about the history of genocide in really complicated ways. And in a few years, he hasn't given us the date yet, but there'll be the second volume um, of this piece of scholarship, which will look at the, Ameri the bleeding Kansas to uh, maybe even up to the end of the 20th century, we'll see, which will cover a lot more Oregon. So uh, encourage him to complete that work. And then of course, um, here in Oregon, we are all really fortunate that the, the tribal nations that are here in Oregon, many of them, if not all, have documented and shared their histories in public ways so that all of us who are not indigenous have access. So this book, As Days Go By, uh, is written by the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation. It's over a decade old, it's still a great resource, but just encourage folks to really learn about indigenous history. And this is, with it, this is not just a separate part of tonight's presentation, but really wanna think about that sovereignty and governance and that ongoing relationship what citizenship means, these kinds of things, when we think about voting rights. Um, so having to do with voting rights, uh, we wanna talk a little bit here, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, language and then also give some gratitude. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier before we got going that I'm not a researcher. I'm not a historian. Uh, my job is to enable historians uh, through publishing the quarterly and hosting public programs. Uh, but I have hung around with them and read their works and listened to them long enough to gain some insights on a few things. And when it comes to suffrage history, Dr. Kimberly Jensen, Janice Dilge, Dr. Jean Ward, Dr. G. Thomas Edwards, Lori Erickson, who curated our exhibit, nevertheless, they persisted at OHS, and many, many advisors and scholars and comrades have really taught me so much about how to think about this. And so I wanna thank them for that. This photograph is of Abigail Scott Dunaway voting 
in Portland, Oregon. I love this photo because the guy sitting at the table behind her looks like he's given her a little bit of a look of side eye there, and she does not appear to care a whit. She is voting after this woman spent over 40 years advocating and organizing and working for the right of women to have the ballot, and here she is voting. So suffrage is a word for voting rights, enfranchisement, the franchise or the ballot are all ways that we talk about voting rights. So why didn't women have the right to vote just from the outset, right? Uh, many people are familiar with the famous letter um, that Abigail Adams uh, sent to her husband when he was drafting founding documents and she said, remember the ladies. Well he ignored that part, right? Uh, but much like when we think about these old European laws and the doctrine of discovery that, that gave um, an excuse for the theft of indigenous lands, coverture was the legal doctrine carried over from England. And it held that a woman's legal and political identity was covered first by her father and then by her husband. So this is this idea that a woman's political and legal identity, it's covered. She doesn't need to have one of her own. And this sounds incredibly bizarre, although folks may remember in the news just during this year, 2020, um, people you know, lobbing sort of I thought balloons or actual advocacy over what they called household suffrage, right? And maybe this idea of individual suffrage wasn't so important. So we see even that coming up today. So many folks who know about suffrage history know that it is deeply entwined with the movement for abolition in the United States. Uh, in 1840, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually met at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. They experienced sexism at that event. They were denied the ability to participate in the proceedings because they were women. So these were women who were already activists working to abolish slavery. And so they began to expand their activism to women's rights issues. They organized the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention. It was attended by famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass. At this convention, they created the Declaration of Sentiments, which outlined the demands for women's rights, including suffrage. Very shortly after this, in 1850, one of the most significant pieces of legislation passed the United States Congress that it had ever ratified, excuse me, not ratified, but ever passed and went into law, and that's the Fugitive Slave Act. So this is 1850, and what the Fugitive Slave Act meant was that enslaved people who had taken their freedom and left the South and gone to free states could then be returned to slavery. They did not then gain freedom by coming to a free state. Uh, folks may remember a few years ago, a very popular film uh, called 12 Years a Slave, uh, based on a book about the idea of a person who was not enslaved at all and being what we would call now human trafficking, right? Being thieved from his hometown and taken into enslavement. And the Fugitive Slave Act just ramped up the debate that was already happening in the United States over slavery. I'll just have to say as an aside, we're hosting a fantastic historian in March, Joanne Freeman, whose book Field of Blood looks at the Congress in the decades before the Civil War. It's fascinating. Get a ticket to hear her talk in March. It'll be virtual. You can do it right from home. Okay. But this is, I'm, I'm, that's a good advertisement because it's a great book and because these decades, these fights over slavery were really at the foundation of what was causing actual physical fights in Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, of course, this is also the time period that the, United, that the United States and Great Britain had decided on the boundary. And so then what was then Oregon was decided by 1846. The United States claimed it. England no longer had a claim over it. So the territorial government in Oregon came to be. And then the people in the territory were deci had decided to go for statehood. So this means, of course, they're gonna write a constitution. So 60 white men, were delegates to the Oregon State Constitutional Convention in 1857. This constitution wasn't ratified by before 18, until 1859. But the Oregon Historical Society takes care of the draft of this constitution, which is fascinating to see. These drafts are high resolution scans are on our digital collections website. You can look at where they scratch things out. You can look at where they've inserted things where they've renumbered things, where they've literally cut and pasted pieces of this draft document. It's really fascinating. 
So the piece that I have up here is the part on suffrage, right? This is suffrage and elections. The contradictions just in these little sections are amazing. You see here section one, it says all elections shall be free and equal. In section two, just here on the third line, they defined that there is every white male citizen of the United States, right? And then go on to say what the age is. So they go from free and equal to white male citizen, right? Section three, over there on the other side of the screen, you go to no idiot or insane person, talks a little bit about what some of these categories might be. And then in case you don't know what white means, in section six, they make sure to spell out no Negro, Chinaman, or mulatto, right? So they're very explicit about these exclusions in the United States or in the Oregon constitution over who should have suffrage. The ratification of the Oregon constitution was lengthy. And I think this is really important to recognize because oftentimes there's this idea of people, oh, people were before their time or that's just what they thought then. The debates over the exclusions of the Oregon State Constitution were extensive. And there were debates in the United States Congress with congressmen saying, this thing is too much. This is not right. Because these are not the only exclusions in the Oregon State Constitution. Many of you may know that what the delegates then did when they completed their draft, they had two sections where it was an, an either or that they sent to the voters. So the voters had three things to vote on. They could vote on the constitution. They could vote on whether Oregon would be a slave state, right? This is 1857, the debates over this are huge. And they voted on whether free black people would be allowed in the state of Oregon. So the lowest margin, they said yes to the constitution. By a little bit wider margin, they said no slavery. And then by the widest margin of all, they said no black people in this state. So Oregon's the only state to come into the, the union with that exclusion in its constitution. What happens shortly after 1859 when Oregon becomes a state? It's the civil war, right? So all of this comes to a head as they say. The civil war, the, the reconstruction period after the civil war um, brought about, again, some of the most significant changes in United States history. And there's a lot of new scholarship coming out about this now and, and really asking people to consider the significance of reconstruction. Sometimes in Oregon, we can think this is a long way away from us. Um, and I am just pleased to say that not at all. Because despite these exclusions in the constitution, black people were already in Oregon and black people were, were here and they were being visible. So Reconstruction, you'll remember that the Emancipation Proclamation came about during the Civil War. And then in the, the wake of the Civil War, there were what I think of as the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery, except as a punishment for crime, the 14th Amendment providing for birthright citizenship, and the 15th Amendment stating that voting rights, quote, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And so these documents here on the screen, that, that beautiful text on the left there is an advertisement for a grand emancipation celebration. It says the colored people of Oregon will celebrate the sixth anniversary of the emancipation of four millions of bondsmen in the United States of America in the city of Portland at the county courthouse, January 1st, 1869 at six o'clock PM. Oration, poem, music, vocal and instrumental and other literary exercises. And it names the person who will be giving the talk, Right Reverend Bishop Ward of the Af African Methodist Episcopal Mission. Just over a year later, the George P. Riley, who is advertised on this bill as the eloquent, eloquent colored speaker, will speak at the Philharmonic Hall Tuesday evening, April 26th, 1870. And he's speaking on, quote, the colored citizen and the ballot what he will do with it, a review of the past and present, the ballot and a glimpse of our future position. You gotta pay 50 cents to see it though. So here in Oregon, just you know, 10 and 11 years after this constitution comes into, is ratified excluding black people, black people in Oregon are standing up, speaking up, speaking out about their rights and how significant they are. I wanna also note the Oregon legislature ratified the 13th amendment it ratified the 14th Amendment by a narrow margin and then rescinded it in 1868 after Democrats overtook the legislative body. 
Oregon did not finally ratify the 14th Amendment until 1973. Oregon never did not ratify the 15th Amendment at all at the time uh, and did not ratify it until 1959 officially. Of course, regardless of whether a state ratifies the amendment, once it goes into the Constitution, it's the law of the land. And so Black men did begin to vote in Oregon in the 1870s. Okay. Historian Kimberly Jensen, who's the premier historian of, of women's suffrage here in Oregon and women's citizenship throughout the, the early 20th century, I would say, has defined three eras of women's suffrage history in the state. So she breaks that into 1870 to 1900 are the early organization and legislative attempts. 1900 to 1912 is the progressive era and the second generation of suffragists. And then 1912 to 1920, is Oregon and national suffrage movements. So I'm gonna just go through a few quick dates here and then I'll come back to some of the main events in each era. In 1871, Abigail Scott Dunaway, that woman voting in her gorgeous outfit in the earlier slide, she founded the New Northwest, which was a woman suffrage newspaper. There, there was more than just woman suffrage uh, articles in it, but that was a main part of what the body did. The first election on woman suffrage in Oregon happened in 1884 with a 28% yes vote. In 1900, the second election on Oregon woman suffrage happened with a 48% yes vote. That sounds so close to me. Huge changes directly after that. Some of you will know them. Oregon adopted a referendum system in 1902. This is why we all get big giant ballots and big giant voters pamphlets because we have the opportunity to vote on laws that the people can bring. So this is a huge opportunity for Oregon women suffragists. And it's important to know that Oregon women suffragists are organized and working with uh, women suffrage activists across the nation and national women suffragists. So in 1905, that's when we had a World's Fair in Portland, Oregon, the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition. The full name is much longer and more racist, but we'll just go with Lewis and Clark Exposition for now. And during that, the National American Woman Suffrage Association hosted its national convention in Portland, Oregon in 1905. Here's a photograph that was taken in front of the Oregon building at the exposition on July 1st. This woman here at the very center to her uh, center front to her right in a white dress and to her left in a woman with a long white um, sash down the front of her skirt, that's Susan B. Anthony. That's Susan B. Anthony's second visit to Oregon. She had come already in the 1870s and done a Pacific Northwest speaking tour with Abigail Scott Dunaway. This was the year they went out and got, the, the, got it on the ballot. It was on the ballot in 1906. The antis came out and they came out hard and they actually defeated woman suffrage in the 1906 election. The, there was only a 44% yes vote. After that, there were huge fights between local organizers and the nationals. The 1908 and 1910 votes had very disappointing 39 and 37 percent yes votes. And 1912 is the victory for Oregon. 52 percent of people vote, or men, I should say, because this is important. Those are the only voters. They vote to expand the franchise. They vote to share power with the women of Oregon. And then, of course, in 1920, the, the 19th Amendment is ratified with much involvement from Oregon women. So let's go back to this first era, right, in 1872. So in Oregon, it, so folks may be familiar, in 1872, Susan B. Anthony uh, and, and her organization called for women to attempt voting under the 14th and 15th Amendment. They said, we were born here, we're citizens. They say on fifth, the 15th Amendment, you, you can't restrict the right to vote, let's go for it. It was the new departure strategy. Um, there was a lot of news earlier this year about Anthony's arrest and fining for that work. She was posthumously uh, pardoned by President Trump. Of course, her, her purpose in that work was to, to be arrested and fined and to bring attention to this, right? In Oregon, uh, as I mentioned, Susan B. Anthony had visited Oregon in 1871, uh, did this tour. In Oregon, Four women also participated in that 1872 action to try and just go and vote at the ballot box, right? And that's what you have here on the left is from the New Northwest from Dunaway's newspaper. She says, well, we've been and gone and voted and Portland yet prospers. 
a little bit of humor there, right? She's saying, look, we just did it. She and three other women went and voted. One of those women was Mary Lorenda Jane Smith Beattie. Now, uh, Dr. Jean Ward, who's done amazing research on Mary Beattie, has given us so much more information about her recently. So we now know that Mary Beattie grew up in Kentucky as a free Black person. She married at the age of 15. She moved to Portland in about 1864. And we'll note that in 1860, the 1860 census, there were 128 Black people and people of mixed race in Oregon counted in that census. Her husband, Joe, led the committee that planned the 1870 celebration of the 15th Amendment. What would I give for some documentation of the speeches that were given there? He also uh, argued in favor of Black people serving on the police force at that time. So she, um, the, the judge, the, the ballot, um, excuse me, in 1872, the judge who was taking the ballots, he took their four ballots and he put them under the ballot box and then wrote their names down. Um, there were no arrests or anything like that. The following year, Mary Beattie uh, attended and spoke at the first convention of the Oregon State Women's Suffrage Association. And according to Dr. Ward, published minutes show that on the second day, which drew the largest audience, she quote, read an essay proving that the colored women are awake to their own interests. And this is a theme that I think comes up again and again of black women looking not just for the vote for everybody, but also thinking about what is the purpose of the vote for black women in particular here in Oregon and elsewhere? Yes, thank you, Bob. The Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition and American Pacific Exposition and Oriental Fair is that full name of the Lewis and Clark Exposition. I appreciate it. So the 1912 victory, uh, we published 13 years ago, this wonderful article by Dr. Kimberly Jensen really laying out the argument for how women won in 1912. And she uses this quote from Dr. Esther Paul Lovejoy, who was a leader in the campaign to, to frame the article. And Lovejoy said, it was preeminently a campaign of young women, impatient of leadership, and they worked just about as they liked. And that is how they will vote. There was certainly neither head nor tail to the campaign. And so what Dr. Jensen really lays out in this article is the, the vital role of a coalition of independent diverse suffrage groups and the impact of modern mass advertising and public relations. Uh, and so that is how she identifies the, the way the 1912 victory was won. One of the people involved in that was Hattie Redmond. Hattie Redmond had settled in Portland with her siblings and her parents by about 1880. Uh, her parents were freed people. They had been emancipated from slavery. They attended Mount Olivet Baptist Church. And at that church, Hattie Redmond held suffrage meetings and lectures in 1912 during that campaign. At that time, she was the president of the Colored Women's Equal Suffrage Association, and she served on the state central campaign committee. Uh, Hattie worked at several jobs before becoming janitor for Oregon's US District Court judges a job she performed for 29 years and she received a pension on her retirement. Now in 1912, when many of us were working on the centennial of Oregon woman suffrage, this question really came up of whether black women also gained the vote in 1912 when white women won that vote here in Oregon. And so um, thanks to some research at the Multnomah County archives, this is among the voter registration cards that have been found. So we know that Hattie Redmond registered to vote and we expect that she did vote. Um, so it's important to understand the kinds of rules and we'll get into some of this that can restrict voting rights once they're legally on the books. But we do know that black men and women in Oregon were voting after the 1870 15th Amendment ratification and after the 1912 woman suffrage victory. So also as part of that 1912 campaign, there were Chinese women in Oregon who were leaders in the campaign as well. So this photograph, again, uh, found by Kim Jensen in her research, it's, it's the, the newspapers marveled at the mixing of Chinese, as they said, with their Caucasian sisters. Uh, there was a luncheon of 150 equal suffrage leaders. Now, at this time, there was an understanding that China might grant woman suffrage in at least one area. So local woman suffrage leaders had sent congratulations to the local Chinese Council of the Pacific Northwest, who was a millionaire by the name of Moy Bak Hin, who was a longtime a community member in Portland, Oregon. It's important to note that in the early 20th century, Portland had the second largest Chinese population in the United States. So this is a big population in Portland elsewhere in the state as well. 
Uh, but so here's Dr. Chan. Uh, we know her only as Mrs. SK or Dr. Chan. Uh, as far as I know, we don't know any more of her specific name. But she spoke, she was interpreted, her daughter provided interpretation at this luncheon. And in her talk, she expanded on the local grievance for Oregon women's suffrage. So one of the campaign tactics that women suffragists were using at that time was saying, look, we're bounded everywhere by states with suffrage. Idaho had granted women suffrage in 1896, Washington in 1910, California in 1911. So Dr. Chan spoke of Oregon's being, quote, bounded by states in which women are on equal terms with men, China completing the square. So she's looking across the, the ocean at this. Now, I do think it's important to note that first generation Asian men and women at this time did not have access to naturalized citizenship in the United States. Now, actually during that reconstruction period, uh, Representative Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who was what they called a radical Republican, was working in Congress to remove whiteness from that requirement for naturalized citizenship. And this was very explicit uh, uh, requirement for naturalized citizenship in US law at the time that you had to be white. Uh, so they were, he was working to take that out of the requirement during this reconstruction period. Uh, senator George Williams, who was an Oregon Senator, um, he led the West's delegation in negotiating instead a restrictive naturalization act of 1870. And so the Naturalization Act that actually went into place and was signed into law disallowed naturalized citizenship for Asian immigrants. So that restriction would not be removed until the passage of the McCarran-Walter Act in 1850, excuse me, in 1952. So this means that first generation Asian men and women could not get naturalized citizenship and therefore could not vote until 1952. Now, of course, their children who were born here in the United States because of the 14th Amendment did have citizenship, and then once they reached the requirements per state, then they could vote. So um, in this post-1912 period, um, there's really incredible work that was going on uh, for organizing voters. Uh, and these are uh, a couple of Black women whose stories I think are important to know. Um, on the left, again, thanks to Kim Jensen, we have this photograph. This is Mrs. Amanda Garvin. Uh, and here again is more proof that black women were voting in Oregon uh, after that 1912 victory. So I'll read you part of this caption uh, that's been published here with the Oregonian uh, photograph of her. It says, Mrs. Garvin has been a resident of this city for several years. And although unable to read herself, she has intimate knowledge of the political issues from what others have read to her. She is an ardent woman suffragist and her political leanings have always been toward the Republican Party. Although until yesterday, she had never had the chance to express her opinions in a substantial manner. Mrs. Garvin is much interested in all questions that concern women and particularly those that pertain to women of her race. Uh, so here's someone who had been enslaved. One assumes it was illegal for her to have learned how to read and she's managed to keep up on all of the political issues of the day and one hopes she was very happy to provide this interview to the photographer uh, and tell them all of what she thought about casting her vote. Uh, there on the right is Lizzie Weeks, who worked in the Multnomah County Courts as a probation officer by appointment from a judge. She was among five people representing Oregon on the National Emancipation Commemorative Society to recognize the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And she worked to organize women to register and vote in the 1914 and 1916. And she was a candidate for Republican precinct committee in 1918. There were some rules that the Oregon state legislature had put into place on changing voter registration um, processes. So it, it made it particularly difficult to make sure that everyone who wanted to be registered was registered. And so Lizzie Weeks was an activist making sure that that was happening. This is all wonderful. Um, and then also I should say, um, there were many Oregon women who were involved, continued to be involved in the national campaigns to ratify the 19th amendment, uh, which did, did of course get ratified in 1920. And then other women across the United States were granted the rights that women had had in Oregon since 1912. And I think it's fascinating that they continued to work for that even though they already had it here. The 1920s was um, a difficult decade for Oregon. Uh, nativism ran rampant. Uh, 
the Ku Klux Klan vastly expanded uh, in the United States and particularly in Oregon. Uh, we know that the Klan claimed about 35,000 members in Oregon by the early 1920s, and they pushed forward significant policy. Uh, one policy was the alien land law, which went into place in 1923 after three six unsuccessful tries. This meant that if you were an alien resident ineligible for citizenship, you could not own property. So of course, who is this targeted at? This is targeted at, at Asian uh, immigrants, right? It's targeted at Japanese, it's targeted at Chinese. Some of you are already thinking ahead to what's gonna happen uh, less than 20 years later, right? And, and World War II, right? So that, but then looking specifically at voting, a literacy test was passed by Oregon voters in 1924. And here um, on the screen, you'll see uh, another uh, item that OHS takes care of in our collections. These are literacy test cards from Clark County uh, that date from about 1924 to 1928. They're printed with approximately 50 word excerpts from the Oregon Constitution, and they were used to test a voter's ability to read English. So there, the 1930s Oregon code said, quote, each applicant for registration who is required to prove his or her ability to read and write the English language shall draw one of such slips at random from said box and immediately thereafter read aloud and in an intelligible manner and then write legibly in English at least 10 words taken from the extract from the constitution on said slip. So who is this law targeted at, right? This law is targeted at recent immigrants who don't speak English from, you know, including from Europe this law is targeted at Amanda Garvin, if she's still alive by this time, right? And anyone like her. This law is also targeted, you can think of it, it it's also targeted at uh, indigenous peoples, people living on reservations in Oregon who are not necessarily learning English. At this time, many indigenous people in Oregon were still regularly living in their communities and speaking their languages. Um, I mean, yet this, we will see, of course, and we won't talk about this much tonight, but some folks are familiar with the boarding school era and really this work of assimilation here in Oregon and across the United States where children were um, really violently treated in an attempt to keep them from speaking their languages. There's much good work being done um, by tribes in Oregon, oftentimes with partners, including at the University of Oregon uh, to really, as, as I've heard people say, wake up those languages and bring those back. So, but I bring that um, to our attention also to note that in 1924, the United States Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act. So in 1924, the United States Congress then finally grants clear citizenship to Indian people or indigenous people in the United States. And that's also a step toward access to suffrage. Although, you know, these are two, two things happening in the same year, so it's complicated, which is, you know, one of the things to remember about suffrage and voting rights history is much like anything in history, there's no linear path of progress. There's no clarity about once a right is won, then that's it, right? Um, so we know these works to, to expand and then contract access to the ballot box um, are repeated throughout Oregon and national history. So as I alluded to a minute ago, World War II, uh, World War II transformed the American West. There's, there's no doubt about that. And Oregon uh, is the same as many of the other states in the far West, including that, as far as that transformation goes. Um, the building of Vanport, which was supposed to be a temporary ship worker city in Oregon, in Portland happened. The tenfold increase in Oregon's African-American population, as well as the instigation of the Bracero program and its entry into Oregon and other states' ongoing reliance on immigrant and imported labor. Um, but I'm going to talk just about just very briefly on, on Japanese American incarceration. And I want to talk about one person in particular, Shizu Uatsuki. And I want to thank Linda Tamura for her work and research on this. Um, as I mentioned, there was longtime discrimination against Japanese and Japanese Americans. So on December 7th, 1941, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Immediately after, there were federal restrictions on Issei, and that's first-generation Japanese immigrants. So there were many arrests by the FBI on December 8th of Issei men in particular, who are community leaders in Oregon and in other states. Folks are probably familiar with Executive Order 9066, which President Franklin Delano Roosevelt put out, which allowed the military to then 
uh, round up Japanese Americans and put them into incarceration camps during the war. So 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans were incarcerated during the war, including 4,000 from Oregon. Uh, Shizu Iwatsuki was born in Japan in 1896, and she immigrated to Oregon in 1916 with her husband, and the two ran orchards in Hood River. There, she helped to organize the local Japanese Women's Society, and she and her husband became founding members of the Japanese Methodist Church. She was incarcerated during the war at Pinedale Assembly Center and Tule Lake in California and in Minidoka in Idaho. She returned to Hood River in 1945. Uh, she continued volunteering with her church and with her community. And in 1952, after that legal change went into effect that would allow first generation uh, Asian immigrants to naturalize, she and her husband joined 30 other Hood River Japanese people. They took classes and she became a citizen in 1954. Uh, so after then she was able to register to vote and to vote. Uh, she also taught flower arranging and was a self-taught poet. Uh, Emperor Hirohito recognized her for her poetry in 1974, and she was Hood River County's Woman of the Year that same year. Uh, so she's that dashing person uh, standing just to the right, our left of this monument here in Hood River uh, that is honoring her award-winning poem. Uh, she wrote Tonka poetry, which is uh, five lines of 31 syllables. Um, so also in the era after World War II, um, I spoke uh, at the beginning of the talk about tribal sovereignty and the fact that sovereignty is inherent, but whether the federal government recognizes that sovereignty can have enormous consequences for tribal people. The era of termination uh, characterized federal government relationships with indigenous peoples in the post-World War II era. Uh, so the, the federal government decided it wanted to terminate its sovereign nation-to-nation -nation relationship with tribes in the United States. Um, Oregon was one of the main testing grounds for this policy. Uh, and so the, the federal policy of termination was, uh, it, tribes in Oregon were among the hardest hit by this policy. Uh, they included Siletz, Grand Ronde, Coquel, Kuslarm, Kwan, Sayuthla, and then followed by the Klamath, who had very large timber holdings. Um, there's a lot of fascinating work that you can read on termination, how it happened, what the machinations of it are. Here's the Klamath Tribal Council in 1955. Um, obviously, a group of people working hard to try and figure out how to stop this policy, and if not stop it, how to make it the least harmful as possible to their people. So um, those the, the treaty relationships that recognize sovereignty in the United States, in, in Oregon, um, Many of the things that tribal leaders did was reserve their right to fish and hunt and gather in usual and accustomed places. So they reserved those rights as well as reserving that land. Um, and so with the loss of federal recognition, there are huge losses of land bases, of, of huge losses of rights to continue the, the spiritual and resource practices that people have been practicing for generations and thousands of years. Um, and then ripping away of healthcare and more. What I want to say is that Oregon tribes restored themselves. So much of their land remains outside of their ownership, right? So people may have heard um, the phrase land back, right? Is, a, is now a rallying cry among a lot of activists, right? Who will say stolen people, stolen land. There's a push for land back, right? And so this is all part of the history that leads for that push. Oregon tribes restored themselves, and some of the people who worked to, to do that restoration and to make sure that those tribal governments could come back online and be recognized by the federal government were women. So here, one of them is Katherine Harrison, who was born in 1924. She's in the far left there at the Grand Ronde Restoration Hearing in 1983. Uh, Katherine Harrison is an Oregon hero. She attended Chamawa Indian School, and she married and had 10 children while working as a migrant laborer. She received $35 per family member on termination in 1954. That's what she got. In 1974, she left her abusive husband and began attending classes at Lane Community College. She graduated from the School of Nursing and she took a job at Lane Community College. In 
She reconnected with Celets. She many tribal people have family relations across many tribes in Oregon, right? Um, she had many tribal member friends there, and she was elected secretary of the tribal council. She testified before Congress for the Celets in 1976. That tribe was successfully restored. She returned to Grand Ronde, which was her father's tribe. Uh, Catherine is Malala person. She worked with other tribal leaders for restoration in 1983. She worked with elected leaders on the Reservation Restoration Act of 1988, and she helped set up Spirit Mountain Casino in 1995. So Catherine Harrison is a political leader of enormous influence in Oregon. I'm going to talk about a few other Oregon leaders, uh, Oregon women leaders. Uh, on the left is Eva Castellanos. Uh, she was born in Mexico and she soon moved to Texas. Her family moved back and forth from Texas to Oregon for many years, as many people did, uh, until they settled in Nyssa in 1957. And that's where she raised children while working in the sugar beet and onion fields. On a trip to Mexico, she saw someone making coronas, which are wax and paper flowers, and was inspired to make them for community members' quinceañeras. Uh, she offers advice with the artworks. So she was called to be, to be a carandissimo, which is a healing practice that includes Spanish, Arabic, and indigenous Mexican traditions. Uh, in 1989, she received a National Heritage Award, and she has been the subject of numerous media stories. And I, I like to include Eva because I think uh, ways in which men, women are community leaders doesn't always look like politics, right? On the right next to her is Susan Castillo. She's the first Latina elected to the Oregon State Legislature and the first, I believe, and only elected to statewide office. She was elected to superintendent of public instruction. It's an office that no longer exists. She grew up in Los Angeles and as a young adult, and, and she worked at Oregon State University where her boss and mentor encouraged her to go to school. And so as a legislator in the late 1990s, she focused on issues of education, women's rights, including access to contraception and immigrants' rights. She also took action related to the 2000 census undercount, successfully challenging the Census Bureau to make public its adjusted count. Here we have Avel Gordley on the left. Uh, in 1996, she became the first African-American woman elected to the Oregon State Senate. Oh, that's Avel on both sides. You all are covering the right there. <laughs> um, she served in the House beginning in 2002 and she retired from public service in 2009. Uh, Senator Gordley was born and grew up in Portland. She worked with Portland's Black United Front and Urban League. She was an activist in the anti-apartheid campaigns of the 1980s, which were actually quite successful in Oregon, the efforts to disinvest from South Africa to fight apartheid. She also worked with the American Friends Service Committee and became a regional director. She led, but some of you will remember voting on, the 2002 effort to finally remove the racist exclusionary language from the Oregon State Constitution, some of which we talked about earlier. And she used that referendum process that suffragists had used that was passed in 1902 to do that. So uh, we, I invite everyone to learn more. <laughs> um, so these are just a few uh, resources. Uh, we encourage you uh, to check out the Oregon Historical Society. The Oregon Encyclopedia is an amazing resource. Um, we have many, many uh, free articles up at ohs.org slash read OHQ, including that uh, 2007 article by Kimberly Jensen uh, looking at that 1912 campaign. And then also since we went into COVID earlier this year, uh, we've changed our emails. And now if you're on the OHS email list, once a week you get an email with all kinds of great history information, links to OHQ articles or OE articles, um, or just you know a little bit to read there in your email. And of course, information for events and that kind of thing. So it's a great uh, newsletter to be on and I encourage everyone to sign up for it. And of course, become a member and you get the Oregon Historical Quarterly as your subscription. So that's my presentation. I'd love to take questions from folks and I can leave this okay, up. So people can either put uh, questions in the chat or you can also, if you click on the participants, you'll see, um, I think this is, well, it's not true for me because I'm the host, but you'll see a thing where you can raise your hand, might be under more. Now you should see something, any anyway, rate, we will look for that and it'll be a little blue hand that'll show up uh, or you can ask in the chat. We have plenty of time for questions. <laughs> 
you feel like you learned everything, learned all the things. <laughs> ah. Thanks, Karen. I love your name. Rain Song is beautiful. It's a great one name. <laughs> yeah, Bob. Bob has his hand up. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Bob. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, Eliza, do you want to say something about the connection of uh, termination with uh, Celilo Falls? You know, I'm not sure about the, the connection of termination and Celilo Falls. I think that, um, you know, the tribes who, um, so Celilo Falls, people may know, is um, it's a great waterfall and rapids in the Columbia River that's now underneath uh, what's called Celilo Lake, which is backed up behind the Dalles Dam. Um, and this is an ancient site of, of salmon fishing um, and also a, a trade emporium. Um, for uh, trade networks, uh, vast trade networks. And so people would gather there and they would, the fishers would fish and they would process salmon for the winter and trade and gamble and marry and all of the things that people do about parties. Um, so there were four tribes that the federal government negotiated with um, for payouts uh, because Celilo Falls, of course, is a usual and a custom place. Uh, where indigenous people can no longer um, fish because it's, it's, it's flooded behind that dam. Um, but none of those tribes were terminated. And also there are many people of the river who refused any kind of agreement with the federal government and continued to live on the river. Some of them still at Celilo village, um, which is there by where the falls used to be. So I don't think, it, so even though that's that same era, because it was 1957 when the, the gates dropped on the Dallas Dam, that had been in the works for quite some time. Um, and none of those tribes that were officially um, terminated were, were those, those tribes involved in that, as far as I understand it. Um, I think that's right, Eliza. Um, yes. Someone else, uh, let's see. I see a, uh, a Karen, question. That Karen Rainsong asks, do you have resources for teaching this history to kids? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, definitely the um, Oregon Department of Education has worked with all of the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon uh, to create a really fantastic curriculum that's called Tribal History Shared History. Uh, anybody can Google that and, and grab it. There's more and more lesson plans coming out all the time for different um, subject areas and different grades, but they've set out a set of essential understandings. And I think that those are important for any Oregonian to understand. Um, at the Oregon Historical Society, um, this I'm gonna put a little, a little URL on the chat there, ohs.org slash curriculum. That page will look better. We're in the midst of a little bit of redesign now, but if you scroll to the bottom, you can click on the curriculum that goes with Experience Oregon and also that goes with Nevertheless They Persisted. Uh, Nevertheless They Persisted is an exhibit that we created this year on history of, of voting, women and voting rights in Oregon and in national context. It's a very broad exhibit and many of the people I talked about today are in that, copies of these voter registration cards, all kinds of things. That nevertheless, they persisted curriculum is good for middle and high school. All of the curriculum linked with, um, linked with those exhibits is designed so teachers can use it even if you don't visit the exhibit. Um, although, you know, we'd love for you to come when, when it's safe to do so. Um, and then I would say that the, um, we are, working with many folks who are teachers are probably well aware of the ethnic studies standards that the state put, said would be required a few years ago. Um, and so we're really eager to work with teachers and folks at PPS and ODE um, to help provide resources uh, to help teachers fulfill those standards. And so um, we're regularly doing some trainings on the Experience Oregon curriculum. Definitely, if folks are educators or teachers, um, you can sign up for the educator newsletter, which comes out once a month and has a lot of great resources and information about our professional development. So that's a, a lengthy advertisement, but I would say there's a lot of great work. And actually, our education team at OHS, we just finished reading a fantastic book called Teaching for Black Lives. And I think it's put out by uh, Teaching for Social Justice, and it's got 
because so many of the teachers who um, contributed to that are Oregon teachers, there's these amazing lessons that they describe that are Oregon specific. So it's very cool. Um, that was a long answer, but thanks for asking that question. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Karen, for that question. Um, Charlotte hmm, Ben, I'm not sure if I'm mispronouncing your name, Charlotte, uh, says, I think you talked mostly about how federally recognized tribes uh, about now federally recognized tribes, but many more Oregon tribes are not federally recognized, like the Kalapuya, whose land we're on now, mm -hmm. and ask Eliza if she knows about those tribes. And I'll point out too that the Clatsop, the first people that Lewis and Clark uh, engaged with, they too are unrecognized and fighting for recognition. Yeah, we have a, a great article up on that ohs.org slash read OHQ that's about seaside. And um, it's it's looking at Clatsop history um, and it's linking it to Seaside in really fascinating ways. So if you're interested in Clatsop history, I definitely would encourage looking at that article and then following the footnotes. Clatsop and Chinook are two tribes. The Chinook are um, West or Washington and Oregon tribes. Of course, you know those are um, colonial labels. So um, so that are not received federal recognition or aren't currently federally recognized. My understanding of the Kalapuya is that Kalapuya are um, part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. And so I know that there are people who are, are enrolled members of Grand Ronde who have Kalapuya ancestry. Um, and so I think that if you're interested in um, Kalapuya history, I would definitely look to the Grand Ronde and they have amazing resources online, including curriculum and all kinds of things. Um, and so, um, and are, are really, I think, have great resources. One of the things that, excuse me, that I said on there that was a, said was uh, that a prominent elder here is Esther Stutzman. And I believe that she's the best resource here. I think that's a good, good suggestion. Thank you, Charlotte. Yes, and I'll point out, we had uh, Esther uh, here for History Pub in maybe September. Mm -hmm. And uh, the recording for that, I believe, is posted on the Lane County History Museum website somewhere. Oh, that's great. Oh, I bet that was fascinating. I'm sure we recorded that. Yeah. Bob has a look on his face like, maybe we did it, but I think we did. <laughs> um, that's good. I'll look that up. What is it again? It was, the, it was the History Pub this last September, and... Um, it was on, what was the title of that? Do you remember, Bob? It was County Name Change. Oh, yes, oh, right, yeah. mm -hmm. Lane County Name Change. Yes, and I know that I sent you the recording. That was the one I struggled to edit. So <laughs> I know that that's up there. Um, then Kelly Osborne asks, in addition to the Oregon Constitution literacy cards, are you aware of any other voter suppression efforts in Oregon? And I, I guess I want to tag on to that one. I wanted to ask, like, have you ever looked at any of those Oregon Constitution cards and tried yourself to pass the test that it didn't work? I mean, I, I have not tried to pass the test because it's not like the naturalization test where you have to know the information. I think those literacy cards, you have to be able to read it out loud and then copy it. So I think I would be able to do it. I'm not aware of any other explicit voter suppression efforts other than um, work that th there, there were some women during the 19 teens who had their citizenship stripped because they were married to um, men who were not citizens. And as I recall, in particular, they were, um, they had immigrated from nations that were then, uh, quote unquote, enemies of the United States during World War I. So there are these amazing files at the Oregon Historical Society that Dr. Jensen has been through where there were these women who had to register because of their marriage that they were now aliens. And she's pointed out just the ways in which these women were very, um, very pointed in some of their remarks, you know, like, um, well, when did you come to the United States? Well, I was born here, you know, um, and so they're really interesting files there. So I think there's, those are some of the ways, you know, I don't know enough about it to really speak to, with any, uh, with any certainty about other explicit voter suppression efforts in Oregon. Um, during the 20th century or into the 21st. I, you know, Oregon has um, recently 
um, expanded voter registration with the automatic voter registration through the Department of Voter Vehicles. That took a couple of tries to pass, um, but it, it did finally come into play. And then of course, you know, um, my understanding is that there can be some challenges with vote by mail for people. Um, I think of that as, as having a lot of access um, but of course, if one's home is an um, abusive place, then that might be one of the places where that plays out. Um, so that sort of voter suppression within the home could happen. Um, problem there being violence in the home, I think, but. Yeah, and I'll point out that the uh, thing that you were talking about where the women who were married to uh, enemy aliens or whatever were, um, that's part of coverture basically, uh, because a woman's citizenship was that of her husband's. And so if a man renounced his citizenship, so this was nationwide, if a man renounced his citizenship, the woman lost her citizenship along with him, yeah. if she, as long as she was married to him. Um, Great question. I would say for this question on on, on terminate, there's a there's a great post on the Oregon Encyclopedia on termination and restoration, and then I would also look to uh, the website of the Chinook Nation and look at the way that they tell their history of their work to get rec federally recognized. Those are two resources I think to look at historic uh, restoration efforts and then contemporary recognition efforts is where I would start. Oh, you can have a ballot sent to a shielded address. That's fascinating. Thank you for including that. Yeah, I know there was a lot of work um, that the Secretary of State's and, and local um, poll offices did this fall to make sure people whose homes had been destroyed by fire could still access their ballots and still be able to vote, um, which is just, I mean, I think we've all seen in the news just the tremendous work that election officials do across the country to make sure ballot voting happens. Um, Jim Watson asks, um, what criteria are typically used to refuse recognition to tribes? Are there tribes currently being considered for recognition? I don't know if you know the answer to that. I mean, that's why I say look to the look to the Chinook Nation because they are working for recognition and their their history of recognition is really um, tragic and and has to do with the the changing of the executive branch over the past twenty years. And so there's um, ways of looking at that. I don't know about the contemporary criteria. I do know from some of the reading I've done, and Marcia, you might know better than I do, that it, that historically in that that um, restoration efforts, you know, so in that era in the later 20th century, particularly for tribes who had been terminated, you know, they had been told you can no longer have a tribal government, and then one of the things they had to do was prove that they had kept a tribal government and kept tribal roles. Uh, so it's very convoluted, but I would say. Um, of a piece with federal Indian policy um, over the past couple of centuries. There's there's great work out there. I think Don Fixico is a historian who's written a lot on termination and restoration. So I would point you to those books. Right, yeah, Don Fixico, F-I-X-I-C-O is the probably leading historian on um, termination. And I think that it had to do with uh, a lot of times with uh, how valuable their land was to the federal government at the time, which is why the Klamath, they mm -hmm. lost recognition because they had these great forest resources. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that that's also true along the coast of Oregon, uh, that because it's the coast of Oregon that we you know, thought other people would wanna live there, uh, they lost recognition and it's really hard to get it back. Mm -hmm. Once you've lost it, you've gotta prove your, uh, you know, literally descended and culturally still intact and all kinds of things like that that are oftentimes difficult uh, for you know modern people because mm -hmm. native people they evolve over time too culturally and socially and uh, that doesn't make them any less indigenous yeah. so yeah at one time there was a reservation of a million acres on the oregon coast as what tribes had negotiated for themselves. And yes, Bob's noting their Kalapuya connections to Siletz as well. That makes a lot of sense to me. I believe that uh, Siletz is where Esther uh, Stutzman, that, that's her uh, affiliation. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> 
Look to see if anybody has their hand up. Well, if we don't have other questions or comments, I want to thank Eliza. I want you all to note that um, I've sent now to Bob the uh, recordings for the last two history pubs that were in November and October. I um, There were technical difficulties with what I had originally sent him and it turned out to be really easy to fix, but it took me a long time to get to it. So I apologize for that, but we should be able to have Eliza's uh, recording up uh, relatively soon. So thanks so much for hosting me. This has been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening. Stay home, take care, wear your masks, all of the good things, and we'll get through it. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you so much. Bye bye. <laughs>